we practice to overcome our ignorance. What kind of ignorance is it? The way you normally hear the Buddha's teachings explained is our ignorance is the kind of ignorance of someone who's coming out of a bout of amnesia. The questions are, who am I? Where am I? But if you look more carefully at how the Buddha taught, those aren't the questions. The answers that are usually given to those questions are these. Who are you? You're a bundle of five aggregates. Where are you? You're in samsara. But the Buddha's analysis of those five aggregates, he said, those are activities. You create your sense of self. And samsara is something you do. It's a wandering on. So the real questions aren't, who am I or where am I? The real questions are, what am I doing? That's a different kind of ignorance. It's the ignorance of someone who has been doing something habitually and not really paying much attention, and suddenly realizing that what they're doing is causing problems. So as we meditate, that's what we're looking at. What are you doing? What have you been doing that's been causing suffering? Can you see the connection? Can you actually see the action itself? Because a lot of these causes are subconscious. And to see them, we have to get the mind really quiet and have it focused on the right places, ask the right questions. When we think about subconscious things, we think about the subconscious or the unconscious as a particular room in the mind, like the basement. And things are going on down there, and we're up here above in the first story, the second story. And we have to penetrate the barrier of the walls and the floors. But the, con the unconscious or the subconscious are not really that clearly defined in the mind. It's anything the mind does without being fully conscious. And there's a lot of that. It's not located in any particular place. It's right here. It's simply that these things happen really quickly, and they happen at a very subtle level. And we've been doing them for so long that we don't even notice them. It's like the hum of a refrigerator. The refrigerator has been on all day, to the point where you don't really notice the hum. One of the reasons we look for inconstancy is to see the moments when the refrigerator turns off. Then you notice, okay, there was something there that you didn't notice because it seemed so constant. This happens on the level of the body and happens on the level of the mind. The Buddha talks about bodily fabrication, which is a physical thing, although the mind is involved in dealing with physical sensations and doing bodily fabrication. He also talks about verbal and mental fabrications, which are more purely aspects of the mind. Bodily fabrication is the way you shape the way you breathe. And we're doing this all the time. The breath comes in, there's going to be something monitoring it and says, okay, that's enough, now it's time for it to go out. And if you look carefully enough at the mind, you'll notice that there are some perceptions in there about what's actually going on with the breath, what level of breathing is enough. Some of this is on the purely chemical level, when there's a, too much carbon dioxide in the blood and the signal goes in to breathe in. But some of it has more simply to do with how it feels, what kind of breathing feels satisfying right now. And because our attention is diverted elsewhere, we don't really notice what's going on. We don't notice the extent to which we're shaping this. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has you see this as a bodily fabrication. He says, try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out, and you begin to notice there's more going on than just air coming in and out of the lungs. There's a movement of energy. The certain muscles are expanded, stretched, others are contracted. They have a rhythm. And to what extent is that rhythm caused by things going on in the mind that you're not fully aware of? Well, the best way to see that is to consciously change the way you breathe, to go against the, what's subconscious. 
And that way you dig up some of the subconscious stuff. But there's a resistance. Okay, what's going on there? What's resisting? Or if you find that you're having trouble adjusting the breath because your perception is off. It'll change your perceptions. This is where mental fabrication comes in and has a, an influence on bodily fabrication. When you breathe in, where do you think the breath is coming in? What picture does your mind have? Change the picture. If you're not sure what the picture is, use one of John Lee's pictures. The breath coming in at the base of the skull, going down the spine, down through the legs, coming at the middle of the chest, going down through the abdomen. And you can try other images as well. The breath coming in and out the eyes and going in deep into the brain, or coming in from the top of the head and going into the brain. Change the picture, change the image, and see that what that does to the breathing process. Same with verbal fabrication. You're sitting here telling yourself to stay with the breath. There are other parts of the mind will say, no, go someplace else. I've got something else I want to think about. You don't see those other voices until you've made up your mind you're going to stay with the breath. Because we normally just drift from one thought to another to another. It's like boats out in the ocean. One boat comes near another boat and you jump onto that boat. And then that boat gets near to another boat and you jump onto the third boat. Everything's all drifting around. And it's all so smooth and seamless that it seems like it's a very natural process. Ask yourself, well, where have you been? It would be hard to trace things back. But if you've got something really solid to hold on to, make up your mind you're going to stay right here with the breath. Then you have a point of comparison. When the mind goes drifting off, you realize that it's drifted. Some people complain that when they meditate, be, meditate, they begin to see what a mess their minds are. Well, the mind has always been a mess. It's not suddenly a mess because you're meditating. And John Lee's, excuse me, <coughs> and John Fung's example is of a house that you normally don't clean. And one layer of dust comes on today, and there's a new layer tomorrow, and there's a new layer the next day, and you don't see the layers of dust because they're just being added to the dust that's already there. But if you start cleaning the house, wiping down the floor every day, you notice every little speck of dust. It's in the same way that the, having the breath here, so cleaning things out, means that every time a new thought comes in that's not related to the breath, you're going to notice it. You may not notice it at first, you just kind of slip into it the way you normally have been. But as you get better and better at noticing the mind and noticing the warning signals that the mind is about to leave the breath, those warning signals tell you a lot about what's going on in the mind. Like a discussion was made maybe five minutes ago, and it was decided, yes, we're going to leave the breath when we get our first chance. And then as soon as there's that slightest little bit of lapse in your mindfulness, you're gone. It's a fait accompli. But once you get sensitive to those little decisions, you can say no. You can change them. So look for that. The next time you notice the mind has wandered off and you bring it back, make up your mind. You're going to look for the warning signals. You don't tell yourself, okay, I'm going to stay with the breath, I'm never going to leave it this time. You're setting yourself up for a fall. There's a lie that's going on in the mind someplace. There's a wall that was been put up. Then there's something sneaking behind the wall. You've got to learn how to pull those walls down. One of the ways of doing it is to ask the question, I want to see the warning signals. So it's, as soon as the breath gets a little bit wobbly, or your focus on the breath gets a little bit wobbly, you have to be extra careful. Then you begin to notice that certain decisions are made, decisions that you weren't aware of before. It's in this way that we bring things up to the conscious level, by laying down a few rules, 
And so we're going to stay right here with the breath. And then watch the mind as it disobeys the rules to see what kind of reasons it gives. And at first it doesn't give any reasons, it just does it right in your face, switches off. But if you get more and more alert to the little things going on in the mind, the more quiet you can get the mind. Then you can see these little decisions, both with the verbal fabrication and with mental fabrication. The feelings that come up, the little perceptions that come up, like those subliminal messages on TV. They'll come very quickly and then they'll disappear. They plant a seed. And if you're alert to them, you can wipe out the seed. It doesn't take much. It's harder when. Once the seed has sprouted and turned into a big plant, then you have to uproot it because it's got roots going down. But at the moment when it's just a seed, it's just a little tiny decision that was made in the mind. You can undo the decision right there if you catch it in time. Otherwise it starts burrowing around and finding other friends inside the mind. So it has its, its team, its gang that's going to gang up on you. So you begin to see that the subconscious is not a place in the mind, it's not some subterranean dungeon. It's simply the mind's ability to do something very quickly and then to pretend that it's forgotten. But if your mindfulness is more continuous, your alertness is sharper, and you really are determined that you're going to stay here. Then you can see those moments in the mind. You can see the tricks that the mind plays on itself, the way it hides things from itself, and the way it's already shaping things. You notice in dependent core rising where the factors of fabrication are. They're prior to sensory contact. In other words, when they're unskillful, when they're done with ignorance, they've got you primed to suffer no matter what comes up. No matter what you see or hear or smell or taste or touch or think about, once these little decisions are in place, they've got you primed to suffer. Now, if you can bring awareness to this process, again, the question is not who am I or where am I, the question is what am I doing? Then you can prime the mind in another direction. Think about the Buddha on his way to awakening. The questions were never, who am I or where am I? The questions were, what am I doing? Am I doing X? He tried different methods of meditation. He tried different methods of austerities. And he wasn't getting the results he wanted. So he turned around and said, not who am I or where am I? The question was, what am I doing? What can I change? And so to see the little things the mind was doing, you have to make the mind very, very quiet in an all-around way. This is why the meditation involves getting focused on the breath and then being aware of the whole body. Because different thoughts get associated with different movements of energy in the body. There are markers as we hold on to a thought for a bit. So if you've got your awareness all around, and you've got the breath energy smoothed out, you find there are fewer and fewer hiding places for the unskillful thoughts in the mind, the unskillful urges, feelings, unskillful actions by which you shape your experience. When you bring the light of awareness to these things, you can turn fabrication from a cause of suffering into a part of the path. So always remember the question is not who am I or where am I, the question is what am I doing? And try to be really vigilant with yourself to be very precise in your answers. Bring the things that the mind has been hiding from itself out into the open air. And 
this is what changes fabrication from a problem into the solution to the problem. So look carefully. No one else can do the looking for you. But if you look at the right place and ask the right questions, you're bound to see. <laughs>